so why is why is Jesus worth like so much time? Like why why is like for you to come out here and like talk to us? Like why is he worth all this time for you? Like why what is he like? Why is I don't know. You bet. Yeah. I'm out here to introduce people to my closest friend, Jesus Christ, and I am convinced that if you reject Christ, you are rejecting the being who loves you more than anybody else. There are not a lot of people who want to spend eternity with me. Jesus does. I can promise you not everybody wants to spend eternity with you. Jesus does. There is no greater affirmation of your life than Jesus Christ. For Jesus Christ says, you're not created to live 60 to 80 years and then become fertilizer. Fertilizer is not God's goal for you. Eternal life in heaven is God's goal for you. And I can promise you, I don't care how many positive think seminars you go to. The fact is that if there is no God, death is the end. Well, guys, if that's true, that says something about you. It says that ultimately your life is meaningless. Because when you die, you rot, and it's over. Jesus Christ affirms your life like nobody else. He says God made you to spend eternity with him in heaven. What an incredible affirmation of your life. And so we were here at Texas State. And too many people are depending on money, sex, booze, a career, athletics, music, art, to be their foundation for their lives. Watch out. Every one of those alternatives will fail you. Jesus Christ will not. That is why I'm out here to communicate Christ is the truth and the evidence of the way he lived, taught, died, and rose from the dead points to him being the truth. Does that make any sense? Thank you, ma'am, for raising that explanation. How do we know what's right and what's wrong, right? If, if he loves something and that's what's holy, then he could have loved anything arbitrarily and made that holy. But if there's something, it's holy, and he loves it because it is holy, then that separates that, that, it shows that holiness is above God, so why would we worship a God that isn't the holiest thing? Wouldn't we just, so, how is it that, that Jesus comes into this and, and fills that slot there? Like, how, how can he be one or the other? Yep, good. Is the abuse of an innocent child ever good? No. No. Well, then why are there so many professors and students at Texas State who say morality is relative? If you're convinced that the abuse of an innocent child is wrong, then why are there so many moral relativists on this campus, both in the faculty and students? The point is, you can't live out moral relativism because you know at the depth of your being that the abuse of an innocent child is wrong. Now, the difficult question is, why is it wrong? Who says it's wrong? Oh, because the U.S. Supreme Court says it's wrong to abuse an innocent child. That's why it's wrong. Give me a break. Dred Scott decision, U.S. Supreme Court decided that black folk are three-fifths the value of white folk. So are you really trying to maintain that right and wrong are defined by a culture or a court, a legal system? You're still right in relativism. The only way there can be an objective moral is if there is a mind outside and prior to the human mind who creates and defines human value and the value of justice. Otherwise, guys, it's obvious who creates the value of justice. We do. It's obvious who creates the values of good and evil. We do. Which means it's all relative, depending upon which mind you're talking to. Jesus Christ insists, no. There is a mind prior to the human mind who creates and defines the value of justice. Now, you've raised an interesting question, which some philosophy professors love to throw at students to try and confuse them. And your point is, okay, fine. So is something good and evil just because God says it is? Or is there a value of good and evil that precedes God, that God is then judged by? And the answer to that is very simple. God is an eternal being without beginning, without end. God's character, which is eternal, defines right and wrong. So no, there is no standard outside of God that defines right and wrong. 
And no, right and wrong did not begin a billion years ago, or five billion years ago, or a hundred billion years ago. Good and evil have existed throughout eternity because they are defined by the character of God. But we don't live in an eternity. We live in a limited time frame. So how can it be possible for there not to be some kind of moral freedom, in a sense, within a limited time span, you know? It, it, well, there is moral freedom. I am free to take this hand that God created and gave me, haul back and slap this beautiful woman in the face. Or I'm free to take out my wallet, give her money for food. Now, if I haul back, slap her in the face and say, ah, God made me do it. Not only I'm a con artist, I'm a liar. God gave me a hand. He gave me a free will. But he created this hand for a purpose, to respect this woman, not to smack her. So, in that scenario, is it not moral to kill your own son? It is, right? Because God told you to do it. No, God did not tell the Romans and the Jews to crucify Christ on a cross. No, no, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about, uh, I think it was Jacob, Abraham, and Isaac, yeah. Yes. He commanded him to kill his own son. Therefore, that is the moral thing to do, yes? No. So why is that not, if God is the source of what's right and wrong, why is that not the moral thing to do? Good. When God called, very good question, you're thinking well, I like you. When God called Abraham to sacrifice his son, right in Genesis chapter 22, verse 1, we read, God tested Abraham. Right. And at the end of the chapter, we read, God stopped Abraham from sacrificing his son. Perfect. So is there some kind of sin committed if he felt like it was wrong to do it? Because God had commanded it. Whether or not it's a test, it was a commandment from God that he was given. So by internally rebelling against that, is that not some sort of sin? No, the sin is, I will value my son Isaac above God. Right. And so, that's a sin that I'm tempted to commit as a father. I've got three sons, and I love the living daylights out of them. In fact, one of them will be out here starting Wednesday with me. But if I elevate them to worshiping them, that is sinful. I'm to worship God, not my sons. But I have to care for my sons. Right. Right. So there's some commandments that are more important than others, right? Well, it depends what you mean by that. Well, you're, you're putting God up here, like respecting God is this great thing that you must do. Caring for your sons is somewhere down here, because if God commands you to kill your sons, you got to take the upper commandment, right? Well, wait a second. God never intended for Abraham to kill Isaac. It was simply a test. And I mean, the text makes that real clear. You can, I mean, yeah, it does. But right? I mean, if he had just killed him on the spot, he would have been following God's imperative. No, well, God, God did not did. allow that to happen, and that was not God's intent. I think regardless, there's a there's a dangerous thing where you interpret the text as God created a commandment that was only supposed to last until God stopped it, right? That's what he did. He created this imperative to be followed until he was to say, stop it. So if God can manipulate what is right and what is wrong for any kind of period of time, how can you say that good and evil is eternal and it's always set and it's always the same. All right. God says that I am not to murder this man. Right. But if I walk into a McDonald's and this guy has a machine gun in his hands and he's spraying bullets into children's bodies in McDonald's, mm -hmm. if I hit him high and you hit him low and we break his neck in the process, that is not murder. That is killing motivated by a drive to protect the innocent from being slaughtered. But we're breaking the commandment, thou shalt not kill. Good which means we've got to look at that commandment again. The commandment is not you shall not kill. The commandment is you shall not murder. And there is a difference between me killing to prevent the slaughter of innocent people versus me murdering him because I don't like his beard and his hat. So he what you're the saying the there way. is a distinction made depending on which translation you look at. I know specifically King James says thou shalt not kill. Yeah. Oh. So thou shalt not murder is what you're saying. Which translation is that? Well, it's real simple. In the King James Version, in Exodus 20, when it says, you shall not kill, just go to the next chapter, Exodus 21. And God is calling the Jews to kill people for their evil. Like, why didn't he just, like, stop the bad things from happening? Like, if he's such a good God, like, if Jesus, like, lived such a good life, like, why can't he just take all the bad stuff away, and then we would be able to, like, love him, you know? Like, I don't know. Excellent question. You're thinking well. 
I do not know, because Jesus never revealed the answer specifically to your question in its entirety. But as a follower of Christ, I have to think. I have no option. As someone who has to deal with parents who've lost a child, as someone who has to sit regularly beside the bed of dying people, and the first point is this. God created you and me to love each other. If love is not free, it is not love. Guys, it's that simple. If you've been dating a young man for the past year, he has said to you regularly, I love you. If tonight your father calls you up and says, honey, I've been paying him $1,000 a week to love you, how would you feel? I wouldn't feel like he loves me. Exactly. Funny, isn't it, how that works? If love is not free, it ain't love. So, obviously, when God created us for the purpose of loving Him and loving each other, He limited His power by giving us a free will. Which means, I don't have to love you. I can manipulate you, I can deceive you, I can jerk you around. Or I can freely choose to love you. So what are we saying? We're saying God took a limited risk when He created us with a free will. And what's the risk? The risk is, we will not love each other. We'll hate each other. We'll be apathetic to each other. We'll manipulate each other. We'll use each other. And that, friend, is the history of the human race, beginning with Adam and Eve, flipping God off, saying, God, life's going to be more fun, separate from you, than together with you. And God says, fine, I respect your free will. But Christ promised there's coming a day of judgment when God will judge us for the way we exercised our free will. Why is there a heaven? Why is there a hell? Because God is good, which means God takes evil seriously and God takes good seriously. I mean, think about it. If there is no heaven or hell, where's Adolf Hitler? And where's Mother Teresa? Where's Adolf Hitler? And where is Mother Teresa? same place. The fertilizer pit. Which means, it doesn't matter what you do with your life. If you want to be Adolf Hitler the second, go right ahead. If you want to be Mother Teresa the second, go right ahead. Because it all ends in the same place. The fertilizer pit. How kind it was of Jesus Christ to point out, no, God gave you a free will, and you will use that free will to determine whether you live your life together with God or separate from God. And if you choose to live your life separate from God, you will be judged for that, and you'll spend eternity separate from Him. But if you choose to live your life together with Him, loving Him and loving others, then you'll spend eternity with Him. So then how do I know if I'm living, like, a good life? Like, for me, it's just like, I'm just, like, spreading, like, positivity, like, doing my thing, like, just being a good person. Like, how do I know I'm, like, living a good life for Him? Two ways. Three ways, actually. First of all, you know you're living a good life when you're following your conscience and when you don't sear your conscience. Do you know how the Nazis trained their soldiers to gas Jews? One of the ways was they would give Nazi soldiers who worked in Dachau and Auschwitz and Buchenwald little puppies. And the Nazi soldier would bond with the puppy and then the officer would tell him, break the puppy's neck with your own hands. And so these Nazi soldiers would break the puppy's necks with their own hand. And their officers were very shrewd. They know that if you repeatedly do wrong, you can harden your heart. You can sear your conscience. So if you break enough puppies' necks who you bonded with, it's not too big a step to start breaking people's necks and gas them into Cow and Auschwitz and Buchenwald. You and I can do that. I can do evil so many times that I begin to think evil's good. Or I can want to do evil so badly that I will say to you, Jesus never rose from the dead. And if you ask me why I believe that Jesus never rose from the dead, I will not be able to tell you. Well, because I've historically studied the evidence, and I have found that the historical evidence is Jesus never rose from the dead. No, that's not the issue. The issue is I want to do sexually what I want to do. And I know very well that if Jesus Christ rose from the dead, he's the truth, which means I'm going to have to change my sexual behavior. 
and I don't want to do that. I'm not interested, thank you. So I'm going to hide behind some intellectual smokescreen that says Jesus never rose from the dead. Not because I've studied the issue and found the evidence lacking, instead because I want sexual freedom, which means I want to do whatever I want to do sexually. My choice. My choice to do whatever I want to do. And that's tragic. That is so narrow-minded and bigoted, it's scary. Have I answered your question or did I miss it? Yeah, I thought you were going to say something about the Ten Commandments, but I didn't know what those were. Okay, good point. The first way you know what's good and evil is by following your conscience. The second way you know what good and evil is by listening to Jesus Christ, by reading the Ten Commandments. Mm -hmm. Why? Because those Ten Commandments are expressions of God's character. And God's character is good. And you're good. Which means if I have a sexist attitude towards you, that is evil. Because when God made you, he did a good job. And when I dehumanize you by writing you off or by trivializing you, that's evil. But you see, if you take God out of the picture, what are you? You're a bag of chemicals evolved to a higher order. And that's all I am. And morality is relative, which means it really doesn't matter what I do to you. It's all relative. It doesn't matter what you do to me. It's all relative. And Jesus Christ says, false. Totally false. That's why sexism is wrong. Because women are created in the image of God. That's why racism is wrong. Because all human beings are created in the image of God. Which means all of us are created to reflect the character of God. It doesn't mean that I'm God. No. It means I'm created in his image to reflect his goodness, his love, his character. Does that make any sense? Thanks for your thoughtfulness. Hard issues. So, and supposedly Jesus was like, okay, this is the better option of everything. Of like yes. following me, there's this supposable historical facts that Jesus is on the tomb and all those other religious leaders have died and they're all in the dirt. Then... Why in the Bible are there so many contradictions of racism, sexism, um, a lot of socioeconomic issues, and then in turn, why is there so much church abuse? Why is there so much things that are like Christians on a stereotype put underneath the rug, and they'll use scriptures to justify, and yet there's Jesus who tells us that, that his way is better, and yet there's so many examples where that may not be the case. So, as someone who's maybe looking in, I mean, like, hey, what is my best option? Then how can we choose Jesus as the best option when obviously there's so many other real-world examples of Christians who aren't doing what the Bible calls us to do? Well, unfortunately, too many of you this morning had good stiff coffee, and you're thinking too well. That was an incredibly difficult, complex question you just asked. And therefore, I'm not going to be able to give you a yes-no answer, that's for sure. But here's the passage of scripture I want you to, for all of you guys to read when it comes to those issues. It's Matthew chapter 19. Religious people come up to Jesus and they say, Hey Jesus, is it okay to divorce your spouse? And Jesus says, No. Right at the beginning, the Creator said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother, be united to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Well, the religious people are sharp. And they come back and say, Oh, really? Well, then why did Moses say that if you, do, if you divorce your wife, you are to give her a certificate of divorce and send her on her way? <laughs> and Jesus responds, God permitted this because of the hardness of your heart. Which means a lot of what you will read historically in the Bible is not God's instruction. Excuse me. It is God's instruction of how to limit and handle evil. It is not God's affirmation. God does not affirm divorce. Because does God allow for divorce in the case of adultery, in the case of a desertion by an unbelieving spouse? Yes, ma'am. Is that God's best? No, ma'am. But unfortunately, due to the hardness of the human heart, yes, divorce occurs. Yeah. I mean, what about this guy named David, a, a man after God's own heart? How many wives did the guy have? And did the guy really have concubines? Yep, he did. Does that mean it's good? No, it does not. Does that mean that the Bible is instructing us that God supports polygamy and having concubines? No, it does not. It is not an affirmation, but there is 
instruction on how to live in a cursed, messed up world. And that really applies to Paul's comments on slavery and the Old Testament comments on slavery. Never once does the Bible affirm slavery. Does it instruct, particularly in Exodus and Leviticus, how people are to handle slaves? Yes, it does. But that is because we live in a cursed, broken, messed up world. Not because God is endorsing slavery. Does that make any sense? It does. And I know you mentioned Paul and the slavery, but a lot of your examples from Old, was from Old Testament, pre-Jesus. So what about post-Jesus in the New Testament when there's scriptures of women be silent in the church and other things like that that people have used yep. out of that cultural context right. to perpetuate their own patriarchy and their own ways of wanting to live to have power. So how do we approach people like that who say they're Christians? And how can I justify being a Christian, I guess, if there's people like that? And so I'm like, okay, well, is Christianity truly the best option when people are kind of twisting it to be whatever they want and kind of making the scriptures be their own tool, I guess? Yep. Okay, but let's be honest. That's a temptation for every single one of us. See, the hardest ethical question for me is, why do I keep as much money as I do? And why don't I give more of my money away to feed starving people? And that's a hard ethical question. And I could be blowing it big time. All right? We have the solution to starving babies called give them money to buy food to feed them. Okay? So there are incredibly difficult ethical questions. And I can promise you, if I don't acknowledge that I'm blind at times and prejudiced, I'm a fool. It's true for every one of them. But now, we've got to grow in seeking to be sincere in seeking to be authentic people, seeking to be honest with God and honest with each other. Now, what about the women being silent in church? You gotta read the text very carefully. Because in another portion of scripture, Paul writes, when women pray and prophesy, which is obviously speaking, they're to have their heads covered. Now, Paul is not contradicting himself. I would argue he is addressing different situations. Point one, when the gospel of Jesus Christ was preached in Corinth, women began to realize, wow, we're free. We have equal value as men do. And they abused that freedom, and worship broke down in the church as chaos erupted. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, when Paul addresses the young pastor, Timothy, who is ministering in Ephesus, where there is a goddess, there is goddess worship in Ephesus. Diana of the Ephesians is being worshipped. And Paul warns Timothy, watch out for women who basically don't understand equality, who think that we come from goddess Mother Earth. And Paul's warning Timothy, watch out. When you watch a movie like Yentl, and Barbara Streisand plays a young Jewish woman, what does she have to do to get an education? She has to disguise herself as a guy. The sexism was horrible in first century. Women were not even allowed an education. You see, it's the gospel of Jesus Christ that changes that. And that is why today, study the demographic in the world with the highest percentage of Christians, guess what it is? Women of color. That is the demographic in the world, around the world, that has the highest percentage of Christians. Secondly, ask yourself, what is the demographic in the United States that has the highest percentage of Christians? It is black women. You see, women and people of color have read the Gospels accurately. And they know very, very well that Jesus Christ never supported racism never supported sexism. Instead, Christ deliberately attacked racism in his first sermon in Luke chapter 4. He made a direct frontal attack on racism in Luke 4 in his first sermon by telling a synagogue packed with Jews, hey, guess what, guys? God loves Gentiles just as much as he does you Jews. And they were irate. And they stood up and they grabbed Christ and they brought him to a cliff to throw him to his death and he turned around and walked through him. What's his best known parable? The parable of the Good Samaritan. Well, guys, there was all types of racial tension between Jews and Samaritans. 
And the hero of the parable of the Good Samaritan is a Samaritan who gets down on his hands and knees and cleans out the cuts and bandages the wounds of the Jew. And then Jesus says, go out and do likewise. So read in context, be authentic, sincere, try to be honest if you can with God, with yourself, and with the text, and God's Holy Spirit will guide you. Yes, ma'am. So you talked earlier about how, like, um, the like the things of this world, like money, sex, like all that stuff will, like, not make us happy. So, like, what do we, like, why are we here? Like, what's our purpose? Like, why did God put me here? Because, like, I didn't choose to be born. Like, why am I here? Good question. Money is good. Why? Because the physical, the material, the body is good. Sex is good. Why? Because God created us male and female. God created us as sexual beings. Mm -hmm. Career is good. Why? Because God created us to work and to build a career. Education is good. Why? Because God gave us rational minds that we are to develop. Family is good. Because the depth of relationship, the love that is to exist there, is incredible. All of those are good gifts. The problem is, when I take a good gift and put it in the place of God and begin to worship it, meaning it's ultimately worthy of my allegiance, that's when all of those idols destroy. Why? Over Thanksgiving. Sit with your family around the table. Regardless of how good they are, regardless of how much they love you, one of you probably is going to be sitting there alone one day. Everyone else will be dead. So if you put your faith ultimately in your family, they're going to fail you. Put your faith ultimately in money. Yeah, there are a lot of perks to money, and I enjoy having money, and money is very important. To take care of myself, to take care of my family, to share with God's unfed children. And yet, to put my ultimate trust in money is to open myself up to be wiped out. Why? Do you really think that money is more important than people? Well, give me a break. Just look at your life. Your relationships with people are far more important than your size of your bank account or your stock portfolio. You know that. Just look at your experience. And you know what brings you the biggest pain when people are mean to you when people cheat you, when, you, when those people you thought loved you turn their backs on you. That really, really hurts. Why is that? Because relationships are far more important than money. Thanks for sharing these few minutes with us. Stuart and I are two of the pastors at Grace Community Church in New Canaan, Connecticut. You can find out more about Grace Community Church by going to gracecommunity.info. Every Sunday morning, we have a 9 o'clock service at St. Paul's Episcopal Church in Darien, Connecticut. It's right off exit 37 of the Merritt Parkway. And then we have a 10 o'clock service at Grace Farms, which is located at 365 Lukeswood Road in New Canaan, Connecticut. Hope you can join us this coming Sunday morning. Have a blessed day.